Hello, and welcome to Hyperactive Highs. My name is Jay, and after a short break, it is again time to fire up the tent for another growing cycle. I'll take you through the steps that I take to germinate my seeds with a 99% success rate and give you some tips that you can use in your garden. All it takes is some clean tools, a few supplies, and some patience to turn your little seeds from this to this. If you want to grow weed that looks like this, make sure you subscribe and hit that like button. I'll be taking you along for this grow from start to finish in a seed to harvest series, with this being the first part. So, without further ado, sit back, relax, toke up, and enjoy. Rearranging my life and I won't look back ever again. You can't stop what's moving. You can't stop what's moving. I'm changing my life and I won't look back ever again. Before getting started, I always make sure I have a clean workspace by wiping down all surfaces and tools with a disinfectant. Gloves are not necessary, but are recommended. Either way, wash your hands before working with your seeds. One thing to remember is that it doesn't matter how clean your workspace is or the steps that you take to ensure a successful germination, some seeds are just never meant to be, however few and far between. The technique that I use is generally called float tech. The float tech method involves letting your seeds float in water with access to both oxygen above and water below. This technique on its own works pretty well, but I increase my success rate by having some control on a few variables I'll go over later. First, let's get our seeds out. If you didn't know, you should always keep your seeds in the fridge for long-term storage for them to remain viable. I use this gem sorting kit that I got off Amazon paired with some numbering stickers and an online spreadsheet to keep track of mine. For this seed to harvest, I'm going to be growing four photoperiod strains alongside one another, each with a similar flowering time. I'm a big fan of variety, and I love smoking different strains depending on how I feel at the time. Not only that, but when you keep a rotation of new strains in your garden, it raises the possibility of finding things you love like a beautiful deep purple phenotype, or perhaps a chemotype that works really well with your personal biology. I've got an interesting genetic lineup for this grow that I'm hoping will result in a melody of terps and aromas come harvest. First up, we have The Church by Greenhouse Seed Company. Greenhouse has been a player in the game since 1985 and has won over 42 High Times Cannabis Cups. You've probably seen some strains of theirs already featured on another grow channel here on YouTube, Homegrow TV, which I'm personally a huge fan of. The Church is a cross between Swiss Sativa, Super Skunk, and Northern Lights. It is an indica dominant profile at 60% and tests around 20% THC. This strain has a high mold resistance, which makes it great for humid climates, and has a flowering period of 8 weeks. The church is known for her skunky smell with fruity overtones that will remind you of incense used for religious practice, hence her name. Also coming out of Greenhouse Seed Company, we have Persian Pie. Persian Pie is a cross between lemon tree and banana crumble. It is an indica dominant profile at 60% and has tested at a whopping 27% THC. She performs well in a wide range of climates and has a flowering period of 8-9 to nine weeks. With deep smells of lemon and earthy undertones, I think this strain will be an absolute winner in the garden. Next up, 
we have Cosmic Crashers by Atlas Seed. According to their website, Atlas started out as organic vegetable and wine grape growers. I can't find direct information regarding where they're located or an exact date of establishment, but they do seem like newer kids coming around the cannabis block starting around 2019. Cosmic Crashers is the result of a selected high potency wedding crashers cutting crossed with a selected Oreos cutting that demonstrated extremely frosty trichomes. This strain has a 50-50 indica sativa profile and can test up to 28% THC. She's known for being a very leafy strain with an 8-9 to nine week flowering time, but makes up for it with a loud, fruity terpene profile. Last but not least is a custom hyperactive cross I've decided to call Blue Mimosa Punch. She is the result of a cross between a Blue Dream by Seedsman and Mimosa X Orange Punch by Barney's Farm, both of which I grew last year in both strains that I absolutely love. Blue Dream is a very famous sativa dominant strain that's the result of crossing a blueberry with haze. Mimosa X Orange Punch is an indica dominant cross of Mimosa Evo and Orange Punch. This is one of my favorite strains of all time with a beautiful orange candy terpene profile that will always leave you wanting more. I imagine that this strain will have a hybrid sativa indica profile with a gassy berry citrus taste and smell. But only time will tell. What do you think the terpene profile will smell like? Leave your guesses in the comments. I should also mention that all the buds on the table and these turntable shots are of a Mimosa X Orange Punch that I grew last cycle. With introductions out of the way, let's get to germination. First, I start by making a 1% hydrogen peroxide solution. Scientifically, a 1% solution yields the greatest success rate of germination with the fastest speed when compared to plain water solutions, regardless of germination method. To make a 1% solution, you mix two parts of water with one part hydrogen peroxide. Here I have two thirds of a cup of water and I fill the last third with hydrogen peroxide. Not only does hydrogen peroxide kill any pathogens that might be floating in the water, but it oxygenates the water as well to some extent. I won't go into details of how this works in this video, but if you want to learn more, I've linked a Debaco University video in the description. I'm using reverse osmosis water, and I suggest that you do too if you can. If you're using tap water, then I recommend that you let your water sit out uncovered for 24 hours to allow traces of chloramine and chlorine to evaporate out of the solution. I also like to add some traces of liquid seaweed to act as a growth stimulant once the taproot emerges, but it's not necessary and quite frankly, I don't even know if it helps, but I like to think it does. Here I'm just filling some glass cups with the solution. Shot glasses work well, but any small cup will work. Make sure each cup is labeled with the corresponding seed that will go into it before dropping it in. The seed should float. If your seed sinks, like mine does here, move it around and see if you can get it to float again. Normally people will say that a floating seed is a bad seed and that a sinking seed is a viable one. But honestly, I don't think there's any scientific data behind those claims, and in this case, we're basically using surface tension to keep the seed afloat. Now that my seeds are in water, I'm putting them on a tray and placing them in a dark place that is not subject to vibration or movement that remains a stable room temperature. In this case, my tent. During the next two to three days, I'm focused on two things. The first, is to check after 24 to 36 hours to make sure that the seeds are starting to crack open and extend to tap roots. You'll see a small white tail coming out from the bottom of the seed and into the water. This is just to make sure that your seeds are good and to see if any didn't take that need to be replaced. The main thing to be paying attention to during this period is that the seeds are kept floating. Do not move the cup around, do not tap the seed, do not do anything to disturb it. At this point, your seed has accessed both things that it needs, water and oxygen. If the seed sinks, it'll probably still germinate to be honest, but for me, I've noticed it's faster if you keep them floating. 
a little over 24 hours later, I'm seeing signs of tap roots. After 48 hours, we have tails. And after 72 hours, we're ready to plant. From here, you can plant the seeds tap root down into your medium of choice. I'm using peat rapid rooters that I like to soak with water and coat with beneficial mycorrhizae, then insert into starter pots filled with a mix of ProMix HP and pure worm castings. These castings come from regenerative practices via a worm tower that I keep in the kitchen and throw scraps into, and the mycorrhizae will form a fibrous bond with the plant roots early to create a strong foundation for nutrient uptake. Give me that crown, getting my way in to be put down. It ain't your place, all this my town. If I want that shit, then I'll get it right now. I'm losing it, the noose, if it's some loose shit, a stupid myth. You choose to live or choose to dip, you choose to fight or lose your grip and lose a gift. Oh. I feel like I'm losing my mind. Is everybody in the world blind? Please, Lord, give me a sign, a sign. No mercy in this world, just hunger, thirsty persons, in different versions, each do what they that shit worsens. Why? Seven days after our seeds hit the water, we are looking pretty. And at this point, I like to give my photo period plants another seven full days to start stretching their roots out before I start feeding them and counting week one of veg. Hey, it's Editing Jay. As you've noticed, the in-house cultivar hasn't quite popped yet. These seeds are the first filial generation, or F1s, and are not very genetically stable. To be honest, I should have germinated a few of these seeds initially to account for this, but wishful thinking had me hoping I'd get lucky. While my second seed did initially germinate, it failed to sprout once put in the medium. I've started germinating a few more backups, but at this point, the plants will be a full week behind the others. This isn't really a problem in itself since this is a photo period grow, but it does cause inconvenience when it comes to things like training and early feeding. Considering how easily and successfully our breeder sourced cultivars germinated, I'm chalking this one up to unstable genetics or seeds that weren't fully formed, both due to my inexperienced breeding, but I've certainly learned some lessons. I'll be keeping an eye on the progress, and if she seems too far behind, I may drop her from the tent for convenience. You'll just have to wait until the next episode to see if she stays, gets replaced, or cut from the tent entirely. I don't want to hide my mistakes on this channel, and I want them to be a learning opportunity for both of us, since I've only been growing for three years, and I know I've got a lot to learn still. This grow is happening right now as I film and edit this footage, so it'll be a few weeks until you get the veg episode. If there's anything specific you want to know about my veg phase, now is the time to ask, and I'll be sure to include that information in the next video. In the meantime, you can follow my Instagram if you want to stay up to date on weekly progress pictures. This is also my first time stepping into the filmmaking arena, so I really appreciate you for staying and making it this far into the video, and I really hope my editing was up to par. But I would love to hear what you liked most about the video to help me improve my upcoming content. Thank you so much for joining me today, and I can't wait to see you again during the veg phase. If you have any questions for me, feel free to ask them in the comments, and I'll respond as best as I can. Links to all materials that I use are also located in the description. I appreciate your support as I get this channel off the ground, and I wish you and your garden the best of luck. See you next time. Too many things going on.